Welcome to episode 92 of Beer with Strangers. I'm your host, Tony Russo, and I'm joined this week as I'm joined each week by Doug, Doug Griffith. <laughs> How you doing? Doing fine, Tony. And I'll get, I'll start out with the weather report. Biggest thing today is windy. Crazy windy out. Yeah. Yeah, I was... Uh, I, I listen. I've got those headphones that like beam your phone into your into your head. Uh -huh. You know, there's no wire or whatever. And when it's windy, it doesn't work. It's like it's like the wind is blowing too, the too noisy the waves. Yeah. No, the wind blows the waves. It cuts in and out. <laughs> so that's how windy it is today. It's yeah. so windy the radio waves are moving. Wow. <laughs> but it's a beautiful day out, but it's just very windy. So nice temperature. Yeah, we dodged a bullet because it was supposed to get cold, and I worried about my fig trees. And uh, well, it was cold yesterday morning. Was just thirty degrees, and this morning was fifty degrees. So. Yeah, but we didn't get any. We didn't get a bad frost. We yeah. just got a light yeah. frost, and they're still alive. The point is, they're still alive, and that makes me happy because I was nervous. Uh, Did you cover them? Ah, uh, no, no. I I only promise to cover them. I don't actually cover them. That's, <laughs> I feel like I feel like if the if the weather gods know that I'm going to cover them, then they won't bother sending a killing frost. Because they're like, ah, it'd be a waste of our time. Uh, but anyway, so far, so far they're alive. I've got two, six, seven trees. So, and I'm hopefully I'll make more this year. And I'll just uh, just start a just start a fig tree grove in Del Mar, the Del Mar fig tree grove. Uh, all sorts of fun this week. Um, just real quick, we want to debut or at least mention that we already have debuted um, an extra podcast. We're calling them sub podcasts from now or podcast extras. I don't know what we're going to call them, uh, but. I get a chance to interview a lot of brewers and I can't always get them to call in on our show or sometimes I do get them to call in, but then I screw it up and I can't get them live on the air. It's a mess. So what I've decided to do is I have an apparatus for my phone now that I can record both sides of a conversation on my phone. Um, and so I'll be, when people are interested in coming on, I'll just do the interview and I'll put it up as a separate podcast. If you're listening now, then you already have seen it in your feed. If you're if you, if this is the first one you've subscribed to, if you want to go back and listen, we have one that has gone up this week with uh, Ryan Telly, who's the marketing guy from the Fordham and Dominion uh, Brewing Company. Um, each week, we're just ho hopefully talk to somebody else. My ideally, it will come out on Thursday, which is when we record this, and then on Friday, you know, we'll be able to we'll be able to mention it as well. Um, this week, we uh, we hopefully will have Tracy from Third Wave. Uh, I recorded a I recorded an interview with Tom Noor from Evo, but uh, he was traveling and the audio was irrecoverable. Um, was it windy and blowing the words? It, it was away? windy and blowing the words away. <laughs> no, no, I think he was just driving yeah. and and it was just usually like the, if you listen to this one, the one on Ryan. Ryan was on speakerphone with a couple other guys, and it's oh, it's still it sounds okay. The one with uh, Tom, I just I just couldn't fix it. So. Um, but I do have a great story, and I guess I'll tell it now. They're, they're coming out with a pineapple IPA. And um, so we talked a little bit about that, the pineapple IPA, and what to expect from that, and also about their barrel aging program. And I'll do a story on that this week, and we can talk about it next week. Boy, we've gone on to bigger and bigger IPAs, and then we're going to different flavored IPAs. So Right. Well, and that's what one of the things we talked about on this podcast um, is Fordham's doing a grapefruit IPA? Um, no, a grapefruit pale ale, and they're calling it GPA, and they're going to have a teacher pinup. That's their. Uh, oh, that's yeah. their. That's their marketing, marketing point. So it's anyway, it's fun to listen to. He he he. It's not very inside baseball, but he talks a little bit about you know how when you're marketing things, you want to kind of tread lightly. You don't want to be gross about it because craft beer people are sensitive. Sensitive. Um, about being marketed at, but also you want to put your beer in a place where people will give it a try if they haven't. Keeps you know, it in, keeps it interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And they do, you know, they, they again, you can listen, but they do all sorts of events up there. Um, every the first Friday of every month, um, they have a uh, a different release party. Um, this week, act, actually, they're not going to have one today. When you're listening to this, if you're listening to the podcast, uh, they didn't have one on April first because they have the Hop Two D Two uh, event which is coming up in uh, on april i believe it's april 23rd but you can check check the website for all of those things so that's 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 the the podcast side of the business but now there's also some homebrew some homebrew news for us yes, yes. we're having uh jesse prawl from rubber soul coming on saturday two o'clock in the afternoon talk about 
um, malts. So if you're interested in brewing, come listen to him. Yeah, um, I, I've spoken with Jesse before. Now he he came up through Dogfish. Yes, um, there, I think ten plus years. So yeah, and uh, and he's been doing great things over at Rubber Soul. I was just ha lucky enough to have their amber. Um, I went to the Hoppers, uh, the new beer garden in Salisbury. Right. And, uh, you know, people, people are giving them a rough time. If you're listening to this and you're among the people giving them a rough time, just let them get on their feet a little bit. They're still uh, there. They, they had to open earlier than they wanted to open for long, boring reasons. So they're, they're still kind of finding their feet. So Gee, a business that opened early? That's unusual. Well, I, I'll tell you what. Just, just because he didn't, he didn't say it wasn't, it wasn't – it's not a huge deal. But uh, their liquor license was – they were supposed to open by a certain amount of time, and if they didn't open, they would have had to reapply. Oh, gotcha. So, so good they, reason to open. Yeah, so they had this super soft opening, but it's a really cool concept. There's yeah. a story on the site if you want to see it. Um, and it's such a cool concept that it, they got really busy right away. I mean, only two of their five restaurants are even open. Like, you know, some of them, right. there's no, there's still That's ladders and paint inside. So they got open. They got open in a hurry, and they're still they're still finding their feet. So and a great variety of local beer. Yeah, thirty plus. Yeah, uh, that was that was the other thing. When Except we were, for the one import. Right. Well, we were doing the interview, and he kept saying all local beer, all local. And I'm like, I I can't say that. I saw the Guinness tap. If we were doing this on the phone, I could write it. But I saw the and there's nothing wrong with Guinness. Yeah. So people like people when people see that many taps, they expect to be able to have a Guinness. You know, it's. Most people, most people expect a Guinness win. But I still think it's it's great that he's got that many, what, right? Within a hundred mile, your yes, hundred mile radius. They, well, just over. It's one hundred and sixteen yeah. miles from here to Baltimore, oh, so okay. one hundred and twenty miles, we'll call it. But they have, yeah, they have uh, Jailbreak and Heavy Seas. They have a bunch of the Baltimore beers, but they have all of the local beers. Every every brewery is represented except for Ocean City Brewing Company and. Um, 16 mile in there and 16 mile. Okay. Those were the two, those were the two that weren't, I think those were the two that weren't represented, but it wasn't, it wasn't for lack of trying. Um, ocean city was supposed to be bringing a beer for them to put on. And, uh, they were still trying to get in touch with their friends at 16 miles. So the point is if you wanted to take a yeah. beer tour of the Eastern shore, you totally could do it right, right there, there, right there in Salisbury. As long as you parked within walking distance, because some of these beer thing, a lot. Of, it's funny. A lot of them. A lot of the people are sending their bigger beers, so it's it's hard to drink too much. Then. Yeah, it's 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 <laughs> if they're big beers. You get full quick. I yeah. I went when I went. I had the uh, the amber by Rubber Soul, and I don't recall the other one. Uh, it was it was just one of my one of my regular go to beers. Probably probably a, a, a third wave. Do they um, offer flights? No, 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 pints. All, just all pints. Pints. So, uh, you know what? I didn't actually, I, I didn't know. I didn't ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, a lot of places do offer, you know, um, flights so that you can taste more than just one or two beers. Right, yeah. I, I wonder if they do. But again, like I said, they're still getting organized. Yeah. So stay tuned um, because it's when it's when they're when they're up and firing all, on all pistons, it's going to be a lot of fun yeah. to be there. I um, mean, our friend from uh, – uh third wave the yeah. uh the barbecue yeah, yeah is is he's got a place there and, and i'm so happy for him because you know i i mean i don't want to sound condescending about it but you know it's like one of those i knew him when kind of things because he yeah. used to just have a folding table out in front of third wave <laughs> underneath a tent yeah and now he's got a food truck and he's got his own restaurant so that that's it's just a it's a success story so there is that um and it, so coming out saturday um two to four you think Yes, two to four. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I got I got lost because I was talking about yeah, yeah. how much how much I like Jesse's beers. They're making good beers there. I also got to speak with the guy from um, Revelation Brewing okay. in uh, Lou Rehoboth, um, and they're hoping to be open by May. That's their target date. Um, they have a production brewery. I didn't know that there was a rough section of Rehoboth Beach, but there's a there's a tough oh, section okay. of Rehoboth Beach, and that's where his brewery is. Um, and they they just they just got approved to open in that church. But he said that's a that's a 2017 project. Um, and they also will probably be on tap at Hoppers because their partners own the pizza restaurant at oh, Hoppers. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's 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 a funny story, and I'm going to write about it this week. But just real quick, the uh, their idea was that they were going to open a brew pub with a wood fired oven. 
and just because of the way the different licenses came out and the different timelines, they had to start brewing before the restaurant was ready. So they started they started brewing in Rehoboth, and then they found this place in Salisbury for the pizza, and then they got the church approved. But the <laughs> idea was it all was going to be in the church, and then they had all this stuff and no place to put it. But uh, I think it's working out. I didn't have the pizza. I went to the Primo Hoagies, and I don't know if you ever had Primo Hoagies, but it was mm -hmm. they're pretty yeah, good. I was yeah. I was surprised. I haven't had a lot of decent subs down here, so happy for that. Um, okay, <laughs> here now the news. That was ten minutes of intro. Um, first up, we're going to talk about dressing up your kegs. Um, there was a, a story this week about some home brewers who tried to get a leg up, and I guess succeeded in in getting a, a leg up in uh, from Brooklyn, New York. Right, they yeah. were from Brooklyn, and they're they're hoping they they make. Uh, is it keg holders or are those kegs themselves? No, I th the way I read it, it was it looked like a trash can to me that right. they um, put decals on or painted up on the outside to make it look like a Star Wars R two D two, and um, they were serving their beer out of it. So it's just a novel idea, and they got some good feedback, and um, they won the People's Choice Awards for the uh, event that they went to. So, I, and it seems to me that uh, they also got in somewhere in the top 10 of the actual beer itself so they're making decent beer and yeah served a lot of it and people like the uh, concept yeah well i guess it gives you if you if you wanted to do the arts and crafts thing it does kind of give you something else to do while you're brewing you can right. you can you know while while the boil's going on you can paint your and if you're at an event and everybody else has just kegs and yours is in a fancy uh yeah r2d2 yep or or whatever i mean i guess any kind of any and the kind floor of, handle look really nice, so you know. Yeah, any kind of any kind of cylinder uh, cylindrical object would do. Um, we have a bunch of we have a bunch of wine bottles here. I just want to mention them because I keep looking off it and getting distracted of them. Now, uh, you you have all this wine that you're going to bottle. I was under the impression that this was left over from your big wine party two weeks ago. You no, know, no, that. we've got some wines that we've made in classes, some that we've made for ourselves that. I have here and I need to get bottled. Um, but also what the push is, um, Sean's made some, uh, has a friend came in and helped make some wine for their wedding. And um, he needs some place to put it out of, out of the primary fermenter into the secondary, the carboys. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any extra, not that we can't go open the box, but right. we keep open boxes and I got some place to you gotta store it. Yeah. yeah. So um, the, best solution is to bottle some of the uh, wines that need to be bottled and then we'll have carboy space and also as a result of that you have all these kegs coming down now now you guys sell this is for like more advanced home brewers they buy the whole keg i'm not necessarily more advanced but people who want to keg their beer rather than bottling so the um you got one there the kegs are five gallon in size and most home brewers make five gallon size batches uh -huh. which comes out to two cases but if you're going to uh, clean two cases of the bottles. A lot of people f eventually find out that the uh, kegs are just one vessel. You clean one thing, put your beer in it, and you can actually uh, um, have it in the keg and ready to drink in about a week versus three weeks or four weeks. So, well, and that but, was that was the other thing I wanted to ask is so uh, do you keg a condition or you just add CO two if you have a keg? Generally, you would. Primary, it's secondary, and then put it in the keg. But some of the uh, different beers, especially the Saisons, we find are uh, real good, fresh, fresh as possible. So you can brew it today and have it in the keg next week. So, and 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 just because the fermentation isn't doesn't take well, as long in a keg, right? Well, no, it, there's no fermentation actually in the keg. It's just the primary fermentation for a Saison. We can actually fermented a little warmer because you get a little more fruitiness out of uh, it and most of the saisons have some kind of fruit or spice in it so it the warmer temperatures work well for a saison and give you a nice fruity and um a lot of get some spiciness out of it but anyway the fruity flavors that come from higher temperature fermentations go well with that style and is it is it like less expensive to have the keg than to keep buying bottles, or is it pretty much the same? No, or? no, it, it it is more expensive because you got to get CO two and a regulator uh, and the keg. But once you get that, um, you don't have five, to get it again. Well, five pounds CO two for most people is going to last about a year. Wow, so you're, you're a thirty thirty five dollars 
uh, per, per year. year. Per tag. And just it's much simpler to put it into one five gallon um, keg versus 50 different bottles. And you don't have to wash it. I'm looking over here at the bottle washer. I yep. mean, you have to wash the keg, but you just have to wash the keg. Right. Now, if you have, if you're a home brewer and you have a keg, you don't have a keg washer. You just use. Just put it on the spigot and rinse, or if you're just outside, hose it down. Yeah, hose it down and rinse it out and um, sanitize it, and then put your beer in it. That's cool. If you if you if the next time you're on a beer tour, you should, if you can ask to watch, to see the keg washers, those are really cool. They're like they're like the bottle washers. You just put the keg on top, and it right. shoots water. Well, out. So a lot of them they just turn them upside. They put the um, disconnect on it or the tap, turn it upside down, and then they run cleaning solution they'll evacuate any old beer that's there run some um, hot cleaning solution through it rinse it a couple of times and then we'll put more co2 in it so that it's all ready to put beer in so very cool and all right so now up on our next story we have um a, a story I, I just didn't i didn't get I, so doug is going to tell the story and then i'm going to ask I'll questions inform you. please ed educate me this comes out of uh Indiana, Bloomington, and it's part of a Indiana University uh, uh, researcher. Um, um, the local brewery, which I don't remember what the name of the local brewery was, but they were having problems. They'd lost two or three batches of beer in bottles because they didn't bottle condition. Their bottle condition in their beer, which means it goes through another fermentation in the bottle, um, and usually they're 750 milliliter bottles uh, with the champagne tops on them, but they had problems getting things to carbonate. So the uh, researcher at uh, uh, Indiana University did some pH tests and found that because they were doing sires, the pH of the uh, beer was very low, which normally is because that's where your tartness comes from your um, so the sire, sire beers that they were doing and found out that the typical way of inducing yeast to have bottle conditioning wasn't working. So they found out that they had to precondition the yeast with uh, the way I read malt extract, peptides, and some additional sugars. So they actually got the yeast, I guess, active rather than putting it in the bottle inactive and hoping that the... Um, so at least would um, um, come active and bottle condition or carbonate the beer. Um, they were activating the yeast before they actually put it in the bottle so that it was active. And they actually had some with some of the uh, um, beer. So it became accustomed to that beer and became active. And when they put it in the bottle to uh, bottle condition it, it did work in bottle condition beer. And so, and this is this is particularly useful for home brewers because if you want to do sours and you have bottles, this is a way yeah, to keep. I had not heard of this issue before, but it's I understand what is happening is the yeast just because it's the pH is down to about three, where there, you probably would be somewhere five or between four and five. Um, it's just too acidic, and the yeast didn't want to start. Now, I, I, have you soured many beers? Is that something that you're into? No, not much. Um, I've done one batch, and I had so many follow-up issues with other batches becoming infected with that bacteria <laughs> that, that I have shied away from that because it was a real pain. Yeah, well, I, and I and I guess that's that's one of the difficulties. Um, it's funny I, when I was talking with I, I was actually up at uh, at Fordham once, and they were talking about how. Uh, Burley Oak has lots of sour beers yeah. on. And one of the guys was saying, well, how can they do it? And he's like, well, the upside of always having a sour on tap is you don't have to worry about that tap yeah. ever again. Right. Like, you, because as you were saying- Otherwise you'd have to clean it very well. Yeah. And with that, serving is not the issue. It's what happens in with fermentation that the uh, the real issues are. Oh, I, I, so. I see. So- the bacteria is hard to get rid of. I mean, there's what other there's several ways to produce sour beers, but most people use a um, farmhouse strain or a bacteria of some sort that um, takes a while for the sourness to come through. And a lot of times they actually are barrel, barrel aged. So it takes a while for that bacteria to sour the beer. Um, but 
it also can contaminate a lot of your other equipment. So right, and so and and that's what the the amount of scrubbing that you have to do is is right. what makes it difficult. And if you're a home brewer and you don't have access to the like the caustic well, gas acid. Well, yeah, but a lot of people who will do sires have two sets of equipment, one for the sire beers and one for wow. regular beers. So. <laughs> that's it. Well, I'll tell you what, you know who should do that? We were talking about the grain father last week. So I guess if you're if you're a home brewer and you're going to upgrade to a grain father, which is an all-inclusive system, then you can start using your old system. Well, for... it's 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 not the brewing process, it's the fermentation. Oh, so it's the carboys uh, and Right, cars, uh, right. buckets, and whatever yeah. you're going to ferment. I, I told you I was so lost on this story. <laughs> and so those, and, you, and, you have to have a separate one. Right, and some of it's done, you can do it at primary, you can do it at secondary. Um, but anything that you're going to use for when you're using the bacterial uh, sour beers, you have to have separate, or it's easier, It's or maybe it's more safe to have a second set of equipment to use. And so I guess one of the things that I didn't get originally from the story is that they must be doing, they must be adding the bacteria in the first fermentation because they're doing the secondary fermentation in the bottle. Well, not, y yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. Um, I mean, they may primary with a regular yeast and then put it into a uh, tank another tank and put their beer in there or I mean the um, the culture for the sireness or maybe they're kegging or putting it in a barrel for letting it sit for a while right but there's all numerous ways a lot of places will put it in a barrel and then that barrel is already infected so you just take your beer out to and you um, package that beer and follow up the next day or shortly thereafter with another beer in there. So you've already got the bacteria in that keg. So it's just continuously um, working. Right. That's like a lot of Belgian beers or that are uh, the Lambics. They're like two years old. And they just, they just yeah. keep using yeah. the same, the same yeah. bugs. Yep. That's crazy. And, and also I guess they can use the same yeast and maybe that's the difference. Maybe the yeast gets well, used to it after a while. Sometimes it's, multiples there's a yeast plus bacteria um they in i know certain places in belgium they the microculture they let it sit out in the open typically in a tower yeah, somewhere yeah. yeah and let it become infected and the chemistry of the beer changes so the yeast starts it which then the bacteria and something else may take over as the chemistry of the beer changes that's and more conducive to the subsequent organisms to it's one starts it but it's wrong ph the second one takes over when the ph changes and the next one takes over when the ph changes right and, again and, so and and so and i guess that's one of the things like i'm not crazy about sour beers but i don't have them very often but i guess that's what gives the sour beers their complexity is that they right. change throughout the and depends upon how sour and which bacteria you use and how sour it makes it and yeah, I, I'm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not not a fan of sour beers, but that's one of those. That's. I mean, if IPAs are a sour wrecker, a, a, a palate wrecker, there's no. There's no yeah. telling what a sour is going to do. Like, and if you drink one sour, that's what you're drinking yeah, today. And you can use something. Remember, you can sour the beer in the mash somewhat, or use a different grain. We have a, a cidulated, which has some lactic acid on it already. You can use some lactic acid, um, so you don't have to use the bugs to create the right. acid. Then it's not as bad as having the bugs do the conversion, so your equipment's not contaminated. But it still has issues with um, how sour it is, and then with the yeast because it might just bottle condition the beer because it might just taste off yeah. more than sour. Right. <laughs> yep. Very cool, and so true art making good sour beers. Yeah, and and the, the people uh, there, there's there are there are people. There's the one in Colorado. I think it's called the Funk Works. But there are there are some breweries that that's what they do. They just specialize right. in making sour beers. Um, and while we're on this, we we don't have to talk a lot about this. But Sweetwater Brewing in Atlanta, which I almost certainly will go to this. I want to knock wood, but my my friend has moved to near there. So oh, good reason to go. Yeah, the, he's been traveling. He's been traveling. Um, he, his company got bought out, and so he's going and like ma making all the systems match. He's a computer guy, so oh, okay. he's converting one system to another system all over the country. So he moved there in 
I don't know, let's say December, but he hasn't really been home no. yet. <laughs> <laughs> I just spoke with him yesterday and he's like, yeah, no, I'll probably be on the road till, till May. So hopefully this summer I'll get to go down to Atlanta and go to Sweetwater. But they're doing this um, as part of like uh, a science like well, a, I think it's just they said they had about a hundred different festivals, and this was one of many that of one of the ideas that they came up with festivals. So it's it sounded very um, interesting, unique, and the and the idea is to 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 do what we just did <laughs> essentially, which is to talk about the processes yeah. that make beer and and let people and let people know about it. Well, I think with any hobby, you've got different perspectives on things and. You go, and if you have enough home brewers, and the way I read it, they were having lots of home brewers who had different presentations. Um, I'm not sure whether the video or just doing one presentation over and over, but you get different perspective on things and try to decide how you want to do your own home brewing. Right, and I, and I thought that, that that's, I mean, we, we need a better camera and all of those things, but that's one of the things that we've been kind of talking about for maybe the last two years is to do these like little, yeah. to, like, yeah. like if, if I could film Jesse's talk or if Jesse could give, when we do these, when you do these talks, I'd like to film them because people do want to know people are, are interested yeah. in this. So it, it's just, it's just good to see that it's popular and, and catching on. Um, and, and hopefully, um, we can do, we can do more things like that here in the future. Um, and, and along those notes, uh, the, um, home brewer event is June 3rd. Did I get that right? In oh, Baltimore? In, in Baltimore, yes. Um, I think that's third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Right. That yeah. that For, now do Thursday, you guys, Friday, Saturday. Do you guys yeah. stay open for that? Do you do? You yes, we're going to be open, but we're going to also be going to to the event to partake of some of the festivities. That's cool. And some of the education too. Now, now, are you so you're not going to have a tent there? You're just no. Gonna we go, we oh. decide not to set up. Right. Uh, we had done that in Philadelphia three years ago, but decided um, it was. We didn't get a whole lot of business from it, and it is pricey, expensive to yeah. set up and set up your wares. Well, and I can imagine that you know, like, unless you're selling, unless you're selling stuff there at like you know cut rate, you're you're better. Um, you're not going to get a lot of people who see you in Philadelphia and then right. come to Laurel. But what it, the main ones who set up there are like um, Brickman who makes the kettles and right they'll set up there so that the home brewers see it and then w we are a dealer so we get the uh oh, you get the benefit, benefit of it right that's cool but yeah. our supplier ld carlson um i think set up brewcraft who we also deal with they'll get the the normal um homebrew distributor setting up so that they show their wares so that they know what you can get at our place and now is there a competition there and like, is there, is there a tasting competition there? Um, yes, th um, there is. And it's usually done ahead of time. You have to send it in ahead of time. And they'll announce the winners at the grand uh, banquet. That's cool. Do you know, do you know if any, if any local guys submitted? No, is that, no, is it common to submit to that or? Yeah, a lot of people do. But you got to, you got to send them in and then they'll, they'll taste them and give the awards at the, uh, the banquet. Very cool. And um, I, I actually saw on Delmarva, uh, United Home Brewers uh, website. Have they decided whether or not they're going to do a competition in Dover this year or in Harrington? Do you know about that? I haven't. I've heard that they um, um, they were looking for somebody who would be the main um, coordinator. Coordinator, yes. Uh, and the homebrew, uh, uh, yeah, the Baltimore event. Um, Sam Calagione is the keynote speaker. Oh, that's so. right. Yeah. So I guess it will, there will be a lot of local yeah. folks up there for, for hometown support. Very well. And as we're cruising into the station, one quick last story. Another big brewery from the west is coming east. Uh, the Chutes is coming to Roanoke. I, I You know what I didn't know? Um, only because I only had U.S. history or whatever. I didn't know how far inland Roanoke was. Oh, I it's way <laughs> in the west part of uh, Virginia. It's a long drive from the coast to Right. Well, I guess they did. How did how did the settlers get there? Is they did they take the the James River? I guess or one of the. I don't think it's. I think it's beyond. It's over the mountains. I think so. Is it a you, different Roanoke from the disappeared colony? You know about the. 
Well, I'm. I, it's, yeah, I know that's Jamestown, though, wasn't it? Close to Jamestown? I thought so. So they must I have thought, named I a thought different this one. This was in Western Virginia. Yeah, that told this. So this road, West Virginia, but Western, Western Virginia. Yeah. yeah, this one totally is. So I, I guess I'll have to look it up. I, I was in Paris, which is on the coast. So it's on the coast. I yeah. was just very excited because. Yeah. I, I, I said, here's another short craft beer that I can go and I can go and I can, you know, it would be a business trip if I drove down there. And then I, I went to look it up and it's not, it's not. But it is out. Was, yeah, it's yes, way, okay. it's That's way out. West. Yeah. Uh, but still very exciting um, for, for the people of, of Roanoke and, and, and the area. I, I didn't, I didn't notice it was, was it was There's about a hundred people there. That yeah. To employ. And that's a yeah, hundred million dollar. I guess eighty million is must be the must be the number for yeah. opening a beer a, a major beer uh, center. Um, so why this is good for us is that we we do hope to have a, a maltery here soon. So I mean this is a huge brewery, but you know hopefully every time a brewery opens, it's kind of good for the the malt business here. Yeah. And if we could get into the if we could get into the wintertime grain business, I think it'd be great for our uh, for the economy right. here. Um, and again, it's outside of my hundred. Hundred mile radius, so I'm not that. Uh, <laughs> but it does give me a give, give me an excuse. We have our friends from Tin Cannon, who were one of the few brewers that we were able right. to get on the podcast. We got that to work, and they're out they're out that way someplace. So um, I guess it'll be good for them because a lot of these. I mean, it, it happens here at Dogfish for sure, but it I heard it's happening in Asheville as well. The bigger breweries actually help the little breweries when they get to town. Yes, that seems the way that, and I just forget what was it the, um, um, yeah. Fat Tire? No, uh, well, was it Fat Tire that went to the all local breweries? Yeah, I think it was. They went to all the local breweries and said, we want to open up here in town. Right. But they're also allowing the local breweries to buy grain from them. So they're doing like a cooperative right. thing. Yeah. So, you know, prices so go reduces, down. Right. So prices go down for everybody, which, which is, go up, prices go down. Yeah, yeah, which is which is which is cool. So it's it's really kind of exciting. We got uh we got into it a little bit on the internet. Not a little bit, but uh you know, I took some cheap shots at Blue Moon and I know that you you don't hate Blue Moon as much as I do. Um, well, it's course. Right. But uh which is now Miller's. Which is which is now Miller, but it is but it is a traditional. I got yeah. I got called out for for claiming it wasn't a craft beer. Um, but since it's traditionally a craft beer, and that's that's what the fight has always been about. Um, but I mean, I'm still not going to drink it. But I will, I will drink this when I go to Roanoke, What's and maybe call it a sheep's and wolf's or a, a crafty wolf's, beer. Remember, that's what crafty they're, beer. They're, they're called a craft style beer. That's uh, that's that's what. So a wolf in sheep's clothing. Wolf in sheep's clothing. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So that brings us to the end of the show. So thank you so much for joining us. Remember, if you're in town. Tomorrow, if you're listening to this Friday or if you're listening to this Saturday morning, 2 o'clock Saturday here, Jesse Prawl from uh, Rubber Soul will be giving a talk on malts. Malts. Brewing malts. And is it like how to choose yes. the, the malt and the characteristics and, and the, stuff the, like that? And the base malts and the uh, all the specialty malts. Very cool. And um, you can find us on the internet at extremebrewing.com, either X-T-R-E-M-E-B-R-E-W-I-N-G.com or E-X-T-R-E-M-E-B-R-E-W-I-N-G.com. Um, you can find me at Surecraft Beer. I'm Tony Russo backwards on Twitter, where I'm meanest, and that is at O-S-S-U-R-Y-N-O-T. Um, but if you come to Extreme Brewing, click on everything else. That will get you to the podcast site where you can get to all the rest of the stuff. And so until next week, drink what you like and be happy. <laughs> all right. Thanks.